Okay, hello everyone. This is Razvan from Community of SEO. And today we have with us Don Anderson. She's been in the um, SEO and digital marketing uh, world for the last 11 years. Uh, she's been doing SEO consulting work and she also lectures at the Manchester University. Uh, a couple of years ago, I think in 2012, she started uh, uh, her company, which is called uh, Move It Marketing, the Move It Marketing Agency. And she's been consulting clients uh, there uh, since uh, since then. Hello, uh, Don, and uh, welcome uh, welcome to the Cognitive SEO Talks uh, channel. And you can subscribe to our YouTube uh, channel by searching for the Cognitive SEO uh, keyword in uh, YouTube. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. It's, uh, I'm really pleased to be here. Yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, I understand you are a very experienced uh, Google uh, chaser. You, uh, uh... <laughs> yeah, it's all good fun. I mean, yeah, obviously, as, as we know, everything changes all of the time. And the, that's one of the great things about the industry. It's, uh, we're never bored. It's not like we're sat behind a desk doing accounting every day and like number crunching. Well, we do number crunch, but it's a different type of numbers. But um, it just keeps, you know, keeps everything so exciting and, and interesting. And uh, like everybody else, I'm constantly digging and looking for secrets. <laughs> so yeah, great fun. What what would be your recommendation for someone who is starting now in uh, in SEO? Oh well, I would say um, just um, make sure you have a few small test sites of your own um, to like, you know, um, test things. Uh, even if you're brand new in the industry, I would like literally spin up a WordPress site and just start testing things and trying things and, you know, read as many uh, good good quality um, blogs as you can and also, um, you know, watch the Webmaster Hangout videos religiously. I would say watch uh, Search Engine Roundtable Recap that's on like every single Friday stroke Saturday. I've watched that for years and I always if ever I'm a little few days behind, I can always catch up on things there. Follow the Googlers that interact with us on Twitter and join some communities. Yeah, so many things. What, 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 what Googlers and communities would you recommend uh, uh, someone to, to watch? Yeah, so I would always I would always follow John. Well, I mean, John, John Mueller is, uh, is, is great, but he's very interactive with the community. Gary Yesh is also, you know, does his fair share of, uh, of um, speaking to the community. A little bit less so, but he seems to have come back into the picture just recently, and it's great to see him back there. I would follow uh, Rusty Brick, Barry Schwartz, uh, who else, Aleda, Aleda Salise, she's always sharing really good stuff. Uh, who else can I think of? So many people, Barry, Barry, he's a good friend, Barry Adams, obviously Cognitive SEO, yourself. Yeah. Dan Barker is great. Uh, just, you know, I could name off two, 200 names. I would also follow some of the Twitter chats that go on. I learned so much from Twitter chats, uh, even though, you know, I've been in the industry quite a while now. What were you doing before doing SEO, if uh, you don't mind me asking? Oh, okay. Oh, well, totally and utterly a completely different kind of business. I had like a, a building maintenance company before I got into Ooh. service. And I had that for 15 years, and I had lots of staff and vans on the road, and one thing and another. So completely different. Then I got into search, love search, started then developing. How did you get? How did you get into search? Uh, it's always interesting to see how how we people get into into this uh, industry. Yeah. And well, all, so the great thing about search is many of us come from such diverse backgrounds, particularly the ones who've been in it for longer periods rather than taking the academic route. I mean, obviously I've done the academic route at the end. So I'm a lecturer and I've got my master's in digital and stuff now, but only did that 2013 and so on. But um, but yeah, so what, how did I get into it? Well, I built websites for the my original business 
and found that actually I kept having really bad experiences with developers and SEOs to be fair at the time. Uh, so I, I kind of thought, right, well, I'm going to have to learn this stuff myself because it was just like one disastrous experience after another. So I started didn't, learning. Didn't you try to go to some SEO consultants? Yeah, yeah, but I didn't have good experiences back in the day with, with knowing who was good and who wasn't. So I started learning it myself, watching loads of videos, you know, just reading as much as I could, testing things, uh, just watching videos, just all sorts of things, everything and anything. And uh, and then I went and spent loads of money on books and courses on web development and started learning PHP and HTML and CSS. And, and actually I did find a really great uh, a chap actually who, who taught me uh, taught me SEO, he's an inter enterprise architect, still is to this day, he was brilliant, a guy called Nisal Kuragoda, and he'd been in SEO for years, he's not so much an SEO now, but he's an enterprise big data guy, and he kind of helped me to learn things from an information architect perspective, and actually that, that st stood me in good stead, because I learned stuff about ontology and uh, computer science, if you like, I mean, completely different to what like, what I've been doing, uh, and I'm still on really great terms with Nissal now, and really trust him. So yeah, he was a great teacher, and then obviously I, it was just awful. It's just at the time you're so frustrated trying to get a site off the ground as a business owner, and then yeah. I, found that I actually loved SEO and searched that much, and. Did, you know, I'm not a developer, but I learned to like develop websites to the point where I could build my own. And um, yeah, so that's how I ended up here. And then it just went on from there. Then I went working with agencies because I switched industries completely because I just loved it that much. And then when Penguin came around, I kind of saw the writing was a little bit on the wall in that SEO was still really powerful, but everything was changing and becoming more integrated with it, with all the other channels. And I thought I need to get really widen my knowledge so that I understand how it all fits together. So I started taking courses on digital strategy, did my postgrad, then did my masters, and understood a bit more about how they all like you could formulate a bigger strategy than just the SEO side of it. If that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, the last yeah. thing. <laughs> okay. and, and now, and now, uh, uh, what do you think are the uh, mandatory SEO uh, SEO technicalities uh, one should consider when when uh, looking at uh, at the site. So for me, what's happened is um, I remember reading a lot of papers. I, re I mean, I do read a lot of academic journals as well as obviously all the blogs and everything because I find that the world of information retrieval really is kind of well that search. It's just you know the academic sense of it, if you like. So I started reading a lot of those things. And when I've read a lot of papers on things that are around like web spam, I remember reading something that said, it was talking about SEOs. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that search engines hate SEOs. I don't believe they do for one minute. I believe actually good, good SEOs, they're really, sorry, my, my dog's in the other room. We uh, love dogs at Cognitive SEO. Uh, <laughs> so, I think everybody knows I've got Pomeranians and they tend to be a bit yappy, so yeah. But um, for me, um, search engines do actually work well with good SEOs, but obviously we always have that element of spam as well. And I remember reading something that said, we'll never win the war on spam. This is from a web spam uh, ju academic journal. And actually the writer of this actually works at one of the biggest search engines now. He said, we'll never win the war on spam, but what we can do is we can make them waste their time and we can make them waste their money, yeah. So for me, what's happened is that actually, instead of it being just about links and just about content, obviously the needs of the user change as well, but, but they've fragmented so that actually now SEO is quite difficult, yeah. There are so many elements that you need to keep on top of because they've introduced like so many different ranking factors we can never guess entirely what they are and that's why we end up with these every year we end up with like more ranking factors to consider and obviously more ranking factors with more weights that are adjusted up and down it's a little bit like 
if anybody remembers a Ubik, Rubik's cube, the number of variations on those squares is just infinite. Yeah. So actually, now there are just so many things going on. I think the key is just to always be trying to make great sites, develop your technical skills as much as you possibly can. Because you need to understand the users, user happiness, Google, uh, as we know, use what they call the heart framework to some extent because um, it's within some of the, the UX um, papers that they share and they talk about it in some conferences and whatnot, which is around user happiness and UX. We have to like really work a lot on, on integrating SEO with UX, but at the same time, we have to understand great content because obviously, you know, buzz and user sentiment to some extent in signal somewhere is massive consideration links obviously still matter but we don't know which ones they're ignoring again same thing we can, they can make us waste our time and they can make us waste our money if we're doing the wrong things so in effect it's not as cheap and easy to be a spammer as it used to be mm. you know I'm not, I'm not a spammer but you know it's a big it's part of a bigger strategy actually because spamming now costs fortunes and you're doing it on a big on a big scale yeah so so it's kind of I would say, look, you know, work on understanding what your users want, understand your target audience, like like they're your best friend, um, understand their needs, what makes them happy, uh, understand engagement, understand, you know, understand internal links, which are to me often now as powerful as external links in many cases, understand site structures, try to understand information architecture. So Very important. How important do you think the crawl budget is? Do you think uh, the crawl budget can influence a site's rankings? You were talking about yeah. internal linking and uh, yeah. all yeah. this stuff. Well, I think crawl budget on a massive site can impact things. I think on a small site, well, you know, the thing is, I think a lot of people misinterpret what it is in actual fact. Obviously, it's two notions in one. Post load, i.e. what can this, what can this client, i.e. that's IP, or this server uh, handle. So if you're on shared capacity and you've got like a site like Amazon, you're gonna struggle. If you're constantly having like server errors, you're gonna struggle a bit as well because the, 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 the actual crawl scheduling, i.e. what you've had bucketed to be visited, is gonna end up then being back into like the short term crawl list. So then they'll go through that maybe before they'll reach the other stuff that actually is, is as important, but maybe hasn't been realized to be important as yet. Yeah. So I think if you've got a huge site, you're gonna you need to look after it. If you've got a site with server loading capacity issues, you need to look after it. If you've got a small site, you don't really need to look after it. But actually emphasizing importance, i.e. via links internally and via a good crawl is just as important as you know, getting a massive crawl because it's all about these passing of like very small important signals I think herding I think herding search engines and passing important signals and topical signals is really important however big your site but it's not about like hey I must get Google to come back and crawl my site a million times a day it's about when Google comes to visit or a search engine comes to visit it's about passing the signals via the site structure and the internal relevance as much as anything else. Yeah. I think that's where a lot of people get confused between budget and actually signal passing between topical signals, etc. So, yeah, I mean, you should always look after technical aspects on a website in any event. Yeah. Even if you've got a WordPress site, you should be looking after things like, are you actually using things like relative links and then finding that actually what you've done is changed full absolute URL to the end of another URL because you didn't understand that actually WordPress is not great at understanding relative internal links that well. Yeah. And actually you're probably better off adding like absolute links there. You know, technical issues can really kill a site all the time. But I remember John recently said, and I've seen it so many times, what happens is Technical issues are like a slow, painful death by a thousand cuts on a big website. Yeah, you don't necessarily notice them at first. But then every week, you get a little bit less of visits, or fewer visits. The next week, a little bit fewer, a little fewer, a little fewer. It's like a slow decline in 
as each URL and a massive website is slowly updated with the crawl, updated with the crawl, and all the signals just a little bit lesser, lesser, lesser. So, yeah. That, how, that's how, important, uh, how important do you think the internal, or how could you use the internal linking structure to boost the pages that if you want to rank because on the on the side let's be honest you have a lot of content uh, that is not ranking and not not ranking well you usually have like probably uh, out of uh, let's say 500 pages you have like uh, probably between 20 pages that uh, 20 30 pages that are in the top uh, top yeah. five top 10 results and then the others are yes yeah. Okay. somewhere around they are not uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. so so this is what i would suggest so um obviously a link from your home page is always really good to a page that's deeper in the site build topical hub pages around certain larger concepts and then use those because it kind of comes back to the old hubs and authorities the um bow tie of the web if anybody ever gets a chance they want to geek out a little bit read andrea broder's paper the uh, oh, taxonomy of the web is it called or is it called the framework of the web there's a um, no it's not the taxonomy of the web oh, i'll update you on that there's two really good papers that actually are really worth spending a bit of time from andrea well there's more everything you can ever read of andrea broder's is worth spending good time on um, he's at Google, he's a distinguished engineer, and he wrote uh, the paper that actually named the different types of queries, navigation, uh, transactional and informational, so he's that big a deal. But actually he wrote a paper that looked at the way that links work. Um, and one of them is called, uh, it has a picture called the bow tie of the web. And it actually th looks at things like link, link syncs, yeah, where actually you end up with these like dangly, dangly nodes if you like pages that don't distribute things well almost like dead ends so look at your use some tools to look at your linking structure completely take a top level view look at it look at how you can like increase the internal links but with topical relevance from pages things like relatedness obviously uh, related posts and you know related pages is always good Use contextual internal links. Be careful you don't look spammy on those. Make sure they're relevant. Make sure that they are connected. And use things like other additional information, architecture, informational views, navigational views. For instance, if you've got, um, you know, for instance, people always just have, well, I see a lot of people that have a HTML sitemap that literally is just every single URL on their website, which is really not a good use of importance yeah so I would say right identify the pages that are actually key and important to your users what are the jobs that they want to achieve what are the things because you'll find that usually those jobs are actually what you want to rank for anyway yeah so I would have those linked to you know kind of make your site map almost like a help center a little bit yeah make it a bit more prevalent and have it so there's all the important tasks that you don't necessarily want to do add, add to your top navigation. And in and with that in mind, I would add at your top navigation the key important tasks that your users want to achieve. Key tasks with maybe some subtasks as well. Again, you'll probably find they're the things you want to rank for in any event. So and they'll probably convert much better because A, they're massively visible, particularly on mobile you'll probably rank much better for them in the first place. Um, use um, on e-commerce sites, use local uh, navigations as well. So say you've got a shoes page and you don't want to necessarily rank for every type of shoe. You can't have a, well, you can't have a mega menu with every type of shoe because that just looks stupid. And you start to then just waste link distribution across your whole site. But actually then, they'd narrow it down the thing. What kind of shoes do people search for? What are the most important things to my audience? And maybe have those as like then tabs, you know, like location tab. Uh, I mean location, a locational menu. So you'll have like global menus that are actually the key things, and then you'll have like a local menu. We talk about sectional within the site. Actually, then pinpoints the top tasks, but that's only really relevant to that category or that section. Yeah. Again, you're then sharing link distribution within 
the importance of that section. And then you can have like relatedness, relating products to each other in that mm-hmm. section. So it's about like clustering relationships between uh, uh, queries almost, if that makes sense, yeah. So I think that's a great way of using internal linking. Link into the hub page, send the hub page then to like, um, you know, transactional, navigational and um, uh, informational queries around topics. So there's lots and lots of things you can do. And hopefully there as well, you will build some engagement as well. I've, I've, um, I've um, heard uh, from a lot of e-commerce uh, store owners of uh, the following problem. Uh, they are using feeds from the products that they are using. Let's say they sell, I don't know, uh, laptops or phones or whatever. They all have the same descriptions, the same technicalities. And usually when they sell like uh, a thousand or 10,000 products on their side, it's hard for them to uh, go and uh, manually edit every single page and this way in the in Google uh, there will there will be a lot of Google duplicate content duplicate content because there are a lot, a lot of e-commerce sites that sell the same product and when you search for that specific product Google must find a, a way to rank one better yeah. than the other but all of those might be obscure products or uh, no external links to those pages. What would you recommend to a site owner to do in order to uh, be able to manage such inventories of thousands of uh, thousands of product which already come from feeds with yeah. you know, descriptions and titles and all no, this no. stuff? So, so, so for me, 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 yeah, I wouldn't spend millions of hours rewriting product descriptions. But what I would do is think about additional utility and that's it it's about how can you add value that is beyond what everybody else is doing yeah so you have to think about well make some videos yeah um additional you know pick pick the most important pick i I would work from well i would work in two ways okay so pick the things that actually think have got a great chance of converting for a start and actually maybe Start off with like a handful or a category or a subcategory or something like that. Make take some additional photographs for a start, yeah. Um, take make some videos, maybe build some content that's around um, that particular like type of brand. Build a guide, build a, a product review or something like that. Build separate sections of the sites, yeah. If you like, then links across across to it. But then it would certainly add, look, to add additional, maybe Q and A's, maybe work on uh, doing something like uh, getting some user generated content in there to get people to in- interact with it. Maybe get some people to add some reviews, obviously honest reviews. Because again, that's just not, not a great path to go down paying for reviews or anything like that. But think about how you can add additional I don't think that you can, if you just rely on feeds, you're probably not going in necessarily a great direction. Yeah. I would add additional value. Think what will actually make this initially just to start with better than just the rest of the herd. Yeah. And just keep adding to that, adding to that, adding to that. You know, use things like uh I mean Google My Business now for a start, if you have like a bricks and mortar, um not just on online setup you could maybe use use the products thing not saying you're going to get necessarily like links that add any value from that but it's just another way of enhancing your overall website with another layer of data that actually google does have access to add photos there um there's just so many things that you could possibly do Uh, reviews pictures you know content um linking content and um, informational views use things that have good structure like xml sitemaps pick and choose don't necessarily add everything to the xml sitemap either um yeah there's loads of stuff you can do yeah 
Yeah, you could do, if I'm thinking, you could do some, some creative videos maybe that you, not for each product, but for some, for each category and it would affect all those products because if it's nothing catchy, it will uh, get all, all, uh, all, of, uh, all of them. Yeah. And this way you can focus on the, on the categories and the categories, uh, you can put that content in, uh, in the product, uh, product page. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, but then I would be careful because I, I, I've got a feeling that some of these recent updates were to do with sites using common content in various parts, yeah. So people just reusing content in other places, but it's like quilting, you know, using that quilted stuff. So, you know, if you can, just try and build that initial category content, make that great hero content. And then I wouldn't necessarily rely on too much overlap on the product pages and I would have it so the product pretty much inherit the, the good quality to start with from a great category and then a great subcategory and it just like waterfall down rather than just like quilting you know what I mean I know that John Mueller said look it's better to have like great page than lots of pages that are just like fragmented parts of the big page because yeah. you're just splitting the relevance amongst for that content or that quilt piece between all the different pages that are borrowing it, I think. And I, I kind of have a feeling that, and I think, yeah, a few others have said, look, it looks to be like people that are using quilted elements. I seem to be impacted a little bit by some of these recent quality updates. Better, better to just focus on great, a few great pages and then keep them chipping away at the others, you know. Yeah, you can always uh, test for conversions using PPC and then focus on uh, improving the rankings of those particular pages on that. Okay. So exactly. you don't spend a lot of time doing SEO for stuff that doesn't convert or converts. Yeah. Or maybe find another way to get people via informational queries on the SEO and then use PPC to like retar remarket to them. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and realize that actually SEO will build out that 80% of the funnel, but there's masses and masses of reach available via all the informational stuff, all the how, to, how to's and why, answer all the questions. Maybe even then start to get featured snippets, get them into the funnel, use PPC to retarget, work with your other channels, maybe even with social as well, and realize that actually SEO initially is not always going to be a converter in a lot of cases it's just there to get your get you on the map and start to actually but i mean things like comparison pages they'll they'll convert often if you have the right content they're not necessarily like a, a product page but they'll they're pages that actually can like feed across so yeah what do you think is the biggest hoax in seo today uh I think one of the biggest hoaxes is, is um, well, obviously we've got all this hoo-ha at the minute about, I think things like some of these massive sites where people are saying, hey, hey, I'll uh, I'll get you featured on like Forbes or Entrepreneur and all that carry on. And I think a lot of those links now are just completely being ignored. And I think there's still a lot of people falling for it. And, you know, we saw some recent, I won't mention names, but we saw some recent coverage Mm -hmm. Where you know things are coming out about some of the, uh, but it's been going on for ages. Oh, I mean, it's yeah. not, nothing new. It's like it's going on for years, for years think, forever. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think I think this is part of the uh, we can make them spend waste their time, or we can make them waste their money. When Penguin Four came around, I think a lot of the um, tool providers that actually. Uh, we're relying a little bit on uh, it being similar, the last penguin being similar to the previous ones, whereby, um, you know, it was all about going to be about disavow and, uh, you know, do you remember the last ones were all like, oh God, people have been stuck in this because they've disavowed everything, but they're still being suppressed because penguin had a role. And then Google says, oh, well, actually, we're just ignoring all those links now. I think actually a lot of the big tool providers that were like relying a lot on disavows had a bit of a shock there and obviously SEOs now we don't know what links are being like ignored by search engines 
totally he's playing in the dark but i think actually it's part it's all part of this uh we can wait make them waste their time we can make them waste their money i think still people are spending a lot of time and a lot of money on links that may actually i'm not saying there's no good good links there are good links there are some great links to be out of there but they're not necessarily the ones that people are spending a lot of money on yeah um and if they are they're spending it on trying to like do some things really special and so i think there's still there's a lot of wastage on budgets on, on links that are not actually bringing any value yeah i think people should really be spending a lot of time learning seo development i think the great sites the ones that are doing fantastic stuff with their websites they're doing that uh creative stuff they're doing stuff that actually makes sites interact they're doing things that actually people want to spend time on websites with they're like they're building fabulous machines um, online really and um yeah and they're building great content in some places. let's let's talk about the future how do you think voice search will affect seo i think it will affect it massively maybe not today but i think in the next couple of years we're going to see especially as a um, i think obviously we're building out a lot of content for answering the questions and we've got maybe our smart speakers in the corner um like uh, we ask google a lot of people at the minute we know just are asking google the weather that's all or they're using it to play spotify or they're saying help tell me how to spell this they're not necessarily like we're in a bit of an seo bubble really interesting studies recently i think Systrix did a great study that actually looked at voice search and how many people are actually using it when we step outside the SEO bubble. I think it was like 70% of people just don't, don't use any type of voice search or smart speakers at all. So obviously we're more technically, technologically savvy than your, your, you know, your person, average person on the street. But it's coming and we are very much, the ones that are embracing this technology and understanding where it's headed are almost like, with the prospectors we can see that that's where the book is headed and i think especially as um especially as uh, things like uh, dialogue dialogue flow uh, which is the the way that you can extend google assistant google actions that's going to be massive because for me in the future search and search and uh, mobile information retrieval of your life will be very much task driven it will not necessarily be like very much around 10 blue links at all. It won't even be around interactive search in that regard. It will be very much around push information retrieval where we get the suggestions based upon the tasks we're looking to achieve, like take an umbrella or, you know, what do you want to do today? Or it'll be an integration with assistants. I think sites that actually do things to help people fulfill jobs we're big winners but at the minute those more forward thinking and building the data layer almost around that and that will be fed up if that makes sense yeah so i would look at dialogue flow and how that actually how you can maybe develop something that works with that extend your site so that actually you can have this like you know you can help people achieve goals even if you've got things like a new site a publisher site or um, you can answer questions around products, etc. of your e-commerce. So look at that. I think there's not a lot of people doing a lot of things with dialogue flow. There'll always obviously be a need for people to read things because it's one of the, and there'll always be informational queries I want to know. And there'll always be people who want to read things long form because, you know, some people just like reading. I'm one of those. I need to digest things often to understand how it works. Um, but I think you're all, you're also better off like trying to find many many ways in which you can meet different queries, different types of media. Obviously, images is massive, a little bit untapped. Videos huge. What I mean about extending that e-commerce content so it's not just a feed. You can do things that actually are that bit more interactive for people. Like you perhaps be a little more future proofing your site actually. Seen as quite a big authority across many t types of media formats because you know people don't necessarily have time to read one piece on an e-commerce page. No. I wanted to ask you. You've been doing uh, 
SEO and digital marketing for, for a while now. And we all have our ups and our downs in our careers. What are uh, some of the stuff uh, that you, uh, if you would be to start all over again, your uh, career in uh, SEO, uh, what are the things that you wouldn't do again? Uh, okay, so one of the, um, okay. So uh, one of the things I wouldn't do, I wouldn't, I probably, I mean, God, you know, back in the day, back in, I don't know, 2011, something like that, when things were working, like cheap and nasty links, we all, we all, you know, we, yeah, yeah. I think I was quite naive at the time, I, was, I didn't pay for links or anything like that, but I did a lot of the, like everybody else, directories and the old like articles and so forth. I wouldn't say I wouldn't do it because that was a different time and things worked then and like you know I would I would not be naive I would always be like trying to like don't necessarily follow the herd and the herd were all headed in that direction at the time so I would always be like careful with things for yourself I would always be like very broad in the things you read uh, don't necessarily follow people just because you think that they're like you've got all the answers no one person in this industry has all the answers. Yeah. Be critical, read widely, test widely. I would always make sure that I try and keep learning all of the time, learn technology, and um, don't be a follower as such in that regard. Yeah. Forge your own path. Obviously, I, I don't mean don't follow anybody on Twitter. I said don't be a follower of gurus because, yeah. You know, nobody knows everything. So, I, and I've said, having said that, I've never been a follower. So I'm saying um, it's not something I've ever done. But I would say I would probably do it even less, given my time. Again, I would, I would just take every opinion, go off, test it, take it on board, respect people's opinions as well, because we're in an opinion industry. I would um, never take an opinion in SEO as gospel ever do you do you do, or do you do SEO tests yourselves yourself I do yeah I do I, I, I test sites I do tests of things I don't really do things that are I don't do any dodgy tests or anything like that I mean I, well, every day I test things every day I see something going up I see something going down I check my rankings or check visibility I know that actually rankings are kind of never in real time but I'll test some things and maybe I'll have a little bit of an impact immediately and I'll think okay then it just drops back down again because obviously I think I think that's something else that's worth knowing and worth remembering if you're starting again you start from scratch is don't presume that something that changes immediately is because of something you just did a few minutes or a few hours ago because they'll also, there'll be the rest of the whole of the web that has to be crawled or the link graph that has to be crawled and everything is always in constant flux, yeah. So, yeah, I do loads of tests all of the time. I work to certain principles. I'm always looking to get better like everybody else and I believe everybody should always, always be looking to improve. Watch every webcast to hang out. Watch them whilst you're watching TV. Uh, try and participate if you can. Um, go to as many things as you can watch as many webinars as you can read as many books as you can read books on information retrieval as well if you're a reader watch webinars on information just watch, read, learn constantly learn web development as much as you can Yeah, learn about technologies because the more you can understand how a website works the more you can understand how, how search interacts with that Yeah. And if you're an SEO, try when you're working with your clients to work with as many of their team as possible. Speak to the developers, say, hey, put me in touch with your developer, put me in touch with your PR company, put me in touch with the rest of your marketing team so that I can be almost like an extension of that or we can be an extension of that if you're an agency. You know, better that you're all rowing with two oars or as a Viking ship oars than like all like being fragmented. That would be my uh, advice. <laughs> Lots of things I'd do differently. Oh, I wouldn't necessarily do differently, but you're always learning. Yeah. Don't follow the herd. Yeah. And Google is an 
ever changing ever changing algorithm how interesting is that how interesting is that yeah very interesting every day i never ever have ever said oh my god i'm bored of being an seo occasionally i'll get fatigued with some of the things i see in the industry some of the like i don't really like some of the like hero worshiping that goes on I'm not a fan of that i don't like some of the catty there's a little bit of catty elements go on i'm not a fan of that either you know, goes going on sometimes. I don't really like all the ego stuff, but that there's a difference between fatigued with some of the things that you see and being bored. I'm never bored, ever. Never been bored of it, ever. Day one. It's always a mystery to be solved. Let's take one final uh, question and let's talk about uh, uh, the mobile speed update that Google said that they are starting to use it as a ranking factor uh since uh, this july and how do you think this will impact the results and what are your uh tips for uh, webmasters yeah. and seos to uh, use this ranking factor in, uh, for their advantage okay so i would say um it's, the, it's mostly going to impact and john has said even John this week said, look, you've got a fast loading side. No point spending masses and masses of time the minute trying to take like fragments off it just for now. Yeah. But if you've got a massive website anyway, and you can take fragments off that time, then actually you probably can increase conversions because Amazon did some studies on it. If you've got a side that side, you should always be looking to like shave off time anyway. The speed impact is for slow sites and actually it's obviously even though it's not to do with the mobile um mobile first indexing it's all to do with the fact that actually on mobile connections in some countries some sites take forever to load if you've got a slow loading site i would be looking to address it one of the biggest things that you can do is like sort out your images so many people just throw massive images into the site they don't compress things. These are very, very, very easy links there. Go to page feed inside. Pick off the top, the things that say easy fix. Look at some of the tools. Pick off the things that say easy fix. Do them imminently, yeah? Some of the longer term stuff, I would certainly not, if you've got issues with, you know, uh, bad content, irrelevant content, you're never gonna run, regardless of how fast you load. I would certainly not sacrifice making your content better um, over time, trying to try, trying to shave off 0.001 milliseconds on a very difficult fix on a site that isn't like massive. Do you know what I mean? So I think it's coming. I've got a feeling it's actually happening right now. I saw a few slow loading sites get impacted on some of the rankings that I monitored just in the past couple of days. There's also rumours of a massive update coming that Barry shared. I wonder whether it's something to do with the speed thing. I wonder if it's something to do with mobile first. I think that actually there's some good address, but I think it's not something that people should be panicking about. I don't think it should be another mobile getting. And I think people really at SEO should be take, looking to take advantage of this in clients. And I see that a lot sometimes. People looking to add on excuses, just add on to the you know. I think, yeah, I think it's not to be exploited. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Don, thank you very much for uh, for joining us uh, today. If you'd like to send a final uh, word of advice to our uh, to our listeners, I would say keep learning. Always keep learning. Don't just limit your sources to one or two or even three. Read as widely as you can. Have conversations with SEOs. Respect opinions. Respect the way people work and do your own thing. But do it as part of it. You're in a team. Work well together. Yeah. That would be it. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, to all of our to all of our readers, follow us on uh, YouTube and uh, on our blog. We are publishing uh, great content every every week, and this uh, cognitive SEO talks at the moment is published every every two weeks. So stay tuned. 
for our uh, exclusive guests. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.